There are so many expensive, echoless, stressless chairs on sale in Beijing. It's a very simple answer to. Uh, well, I read a little article on okay. the internet. Yeah. yeah. It's partly, but let's go into details. Probably 80% of all chairs produced at Econes is sold at foreign or internationally. So there are fewer in Sykkylven where they produce this chair that have stressless compared to Beijing. Okay? Although they can get it for half the price in Sykkylven, so it's even cheaper than the price level in Norway. There is one simple answer to it. There are more millionaires in Beijing compared to Sykkylven. In Sykkylven, you can count the millionaires on two hands, I think. Can you do that in Beijing? Can you count the multi-billion millionaires on one hand in Beijing? No. Can you count the billionaires in China on one hand? No. What do these billionaires and millionaires use their money for? They buy furniture. What kind of furniture would you buy if you are in China to be different from all the others? It's not Chinese, but Norwegian. Norwegian, Norwegian because they have stressless, the original stressless. So there are very few others in the suburbs of Beijing that have a stressless. So let's buy one. The problem is they don't know the Norwegian price level. They don't know that Econess would have sold it to a lower price. But they want few Chinese to have it. What is the best way to have few consumers is price. high price. And the higher, the better. So in Sykkylven, there are so few having Econess they get it for half the price. In Beijing, there are so many willing to buy the high price they but, need. Uh, why is it a Norwegian brand? Why not uh, you know, a brand from another country in Italy and France? Simply because it's Norwegian. Simply because it's Norwegian. If you are in Beijing, there will be a lot of people having French furniture or German furniture or whatever. But why is I think it started when they had a sales office in the US. If you have a sales office, there are few having it. And I mean, if you are Chinese and want to compare with somebody, it must be with the US citizens. Are there a US citizen that seems to be the only one to have a furniture? It will be the one that have a Econess stressless. So it's simply, you see it all over the world. There are so few having it. This is the thing we need. We need it in, let's say, a corner. The kids are not allowed to use it, but we are the only one in the neighborhood that have an Econess. And then you can increase the price, okay? Is Econess selling furniture everywhere? Yes, they do. Do they sell it at a low price? No, they don't. Why don't they have to cut the prices? It's simply because there are enough millionaires willing to pay for Econess tiers so they can do it. So therefore, they are not selling very many to Vietnam or to Bangladesh. Although there could be a few Econess in Bangladesh for all I know, because there are more people living in Bangladesh than in Sikulden. So the probability would be there. But that is maybe the most important part for a country that wants to develop start to sell a product that you can earn money of, and the more exclusive it is, the more money you will get. So home fish, Norwegian fish for German students would be a, a very exclusive dish because it's hard to catch the fishes. That is what Stressless from Econess is about. There are so many that wants it. 
But the price is so high that very few can get it. And the fewer that pays a higher price, the more Econels will earn. Because there are enough millionaires all over the world, so they cannot produce all the furniture in Sikilven, but the expensive one, they can do that. But since none of you are from Brazil, I cannot send you home and say, exploit your comparative advantages. But that is probably the easiest way to develop. Use the resources where you get more out of them. And that is export, 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 export. OK? This is the gospel of David Ricardo. He was not one of Christ's disciples, but the, the gospel is the same. It lasts forever. Use your comparative advantage, sell it to where you get most out of it, and that is export it. Because they won't pay the same sum of money for it in Norway. <coughs> okay. Now we've shifted to Italian cars. And we could speak of Lamborghinis. Because there are a few in Norway, there are more in Beijing than in Norway. Like with Stressless from Econes. 20% Norway, 80% of four times outside Norway. So we have a few Lamborghinis. I think we also have a Ferrari. If you look up Norwegian uh, papers on net, there is a Ferrari accident somewhere in Norway at a high speed had driven off the road and into the woods. That is not the way you should drive an Italian fast speed car. We agree upon that. Yeah. So if you have a Ferrari, keep it on the road. But they could have exported it to Vietnam. In Vietnam, they would earn less than exporting it to Norway. But this is an additional production of Ferraris, and they earn money of it. So that is the advantage of trade. You can sell it all over. Any country, there will be a consumer. Some will pay a high price, but all of them will pay the price of the production of it. OK? Can you produce millions of Ferraris, Lamborghinis? Maseratis. So sell it to those who are willing to pay most for it. But probably there is one in Vietnam too. For all I know, there can be four selling a Ferrari if he wants to. But keep him on the road. That is the last thing you need to hear when he buys it. Okay. So because of GDP per inhabitant, that doesn't mean that they can import any goods because there are some very rich that are willing to pay for the very expensive products as well. OK? Have you heard of offshore vessels? Boats where you can fish, but normally do not fish from. OK. I have a son working on board one. So they have a camera when they operate the subsea technology down there, where he can see, I think it's fishes, 90 meters below sea level. They don't look very eatingly, but they are living. So probably there are food in them. But offshore vessels started to pro be produced in Norway in late 70s, I think. Now we are leading producer of offshore subsea technology. Why are we a leading producer? So early. Yes, we call it the Chinese syndrome. Simply, we were the first. We have the advantage of being first. Then we know the technology. And that is why Germany struggles with the French high-speed technology, because they came first. They were the first to produce. So it's always an advantage of being first. 
And this is the gospel of me. If you are a country deciding to develop, pick you a product that you can be probably world lead, earning a lot of money because you're the only one or the best producer. So therefore, do not substitute import if you get the chance. But Germany is past that position. France, Norway is, but I think Welcome could be learning from it. Yeah. Okay, so this is chapter 11. Chapter 12 is about the controversies in trade policy. Okay? Do you know of any controversies of trade policy? Not yet. You will know before 5 o'clock. At least of two. Is it wrong to give public support to industry? Not if you are developing, but probably for export. So if this had been Norway instead of, let's say, Bangladesh, and we go back 100 years, then we are back to 1914. Then Norway started to, to in industrialize. My advice, if I could go back a hundred years, would be to echo this and say, do as you plan to. What are they doing? They produce, and the biggest market is export. Why should they export? Because they earn more money. Why should they earn more money? Norway will then have more money to develop from. So yes, do as they did. Do you know what Norway started to produce? and that we are linked to France. Do any of you know somebody who is running a farm? And knows that they use fertilizer, which could be natural fertilizer, which is the shit of the animals, or produced by hydro. It's a Norwegian company. What do they produce? Fertilizers. What do they use it for? Improve the production capacity of agriculture. Where did they start? In eastern Norway. Close to a waterfall. What did they use the waterfall for? Producing energy. What do, did they use the energy for? They took the nitrogen out of the air. So you simply produce a machinery or a tool where you let air between two points with high electricity and out came nitrogen, which is the essential part of a fertilizer. Why did they produce it in a factory? when it is up in the air. It's, it's easier to put it into a fertilizer product and put it into the earth than it is for the plants to pick it out from the air. Why did they use French money? Because they had no money in Norway. Not enough money to produce it in Norway. Okay? So what you need is a waterfall We have a lot in Norway. 100 years ago, you needed money, and we had no money in Norway. Not German money. Most of it was British money. Because I think the British had been here and seen the waterfalls and knew that they could produce energy out of it. But that was the start of Norway. Was this a known product in 1914? And the answer is no new technology. Okay, So that was a Norwegian success. Let me tell you about two Norwegian disasters. A few 20 years earlier, the American telephone company came to Drummond and offered the, uh, the companies in Drummond to take part in an investment to build telephone services. And you know the answer. 
I looked at them and said, this would be a nice tool for housewives, but probably no one else would use it because we have Telefax. And you know what it is? Do you know somebody who uses it now? No. Do you know somebody who using telephone now? No one? All of you. In addition, you use it as a PC. They didn't know that in Drummond 150 years ago. That was a disaster. Then there is another. When the uh, cell phone companies gather in a meeting in, drum in, in Paris, they wanted to come up with a new technology for using these cell phones. There were several firms, persons, companies that offer the new technology. Guess what technology they chose? The Norwegian GSM. New technology founded in the Norwegian University for Natural uh, Sciences, NTNU. Is this now Norwegian produced? No. Guess who bought it? A Finnish booth producer and tire producer called, are they producing tires at Nokia now? No, they use the Norwegian technology, GSM. Another Norwegian disaster. So come up with new technology, but keep it national. Don't sell it out. And if somebody comes in and gives you an opportunity to invest into new technology, grab it as long as you can export. Do you think Norway would have exported telephones now if they had been part of the company in 1894? Probably they would. Could you do this only on private money? And then I have to ask the Norwegian, who supports the Norwegian University for Natural Sciences? Who pays for them? The Norwegian state, public money. So if you want new technology to develop, get public money. And I think you are linked to internet. Do you think that is a private uh, technology developed by private companies? No. Public support for American Research Institute came up with the solution. Now it is very valuable technology. So yes, get public money into it. Why should we put public money into it is knowledge. GSM is a technology improving your knowledge of producing cell phones. Use public money to come up with it. So promise me, as soon as you are the Minister of Commerce or Trade or uh, Education, the first thing you tell the Minister of Finance is, I need half of your money because I need new technology for us to develop and go back to Lithuania, Bangladesh, the Central Republic of Africa, places where they need new technology and export. Okay. And if you are Minister of Commerce, I have a very good ID, but I need money, then I can call you, I hope. Okay, that's a fair deal. <coughs> Have you heard of the Norwegian Oil Fund? Do you know how much money it is in it just now? 5,000 billion. We have 5 million. How much is it per inhabitant? 1 billion. That sounds like okay amount of money, doesn't it? It's only a tenth of what knowledge means to Norwegian production. 80 or maybe 85% of, let's say, of future values is inside here, or there, or there, or there, or there, or everywhere. The most important asset a country has 
is inside here. So get more of it inside there. Improve the knowledge. OK. Who will gain from it? Who gained from internet? Microsoft and Apple. If you ask me, too much. Because they are monopolies. And they earn a hell of a lot of money. If you ask Stieglitz, it's not according to economic theory. But that is if you remember your microeconomic courses. None of you do. Okay. But according to microeconomic courses, you learn when you are younger than you are now, because now you're one year older, is simply this. If there is a market where there is super profit, everyone will move into it. So why are there not many Microsoft companies or many Apple companies? Is there are something with the market, the market structure, that makes it impossible. So if you solve that, you will be a billionaire. And then you can meet any of these billion, 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 billionaires at uh, Davos in Switzerland in a few years' time. And you will be one of the guys. Because there are male, most of them. OK. Have this been done before? Yes. And we call it reverse engineer or Japanese cars in the 50s. All you need to produce a car is get a copy of one. Recopy it, or what we call reverse design of it. Put it in a different vehicle, same technology, using the same uh, petrol, and then you have a success. So the Japanese wonder is simply a copy of an already proven wonder. So reverse engineer simply means copy it, make it cheaper, see to that new consumers buy it. So the problem is, remember that one, this is your Econess stressless, but don't sell it to Beijing. Why not? It's too cheap. But that gives you much more consumers all over the world, so you can sell it. So the Japanese cars were cheaper, more of, and very soon most of the production came from Japanese car producers. Does it still do that? I think they are producing cars in South Korea, in China, in Czechia, and so on. So more and more of the car producers are spread around. So we can still call it reverse engineer. It simply means you copy it, produce a new version, and that is bad. So why don't we have new versions of Microsoft and Apple? It's up to you to solve. And she will be the Minister of Commerce in Norway, so she's interesting. So you just call her when you have the answer. Government support. Why government support? Well, let's go back here. Norway had water ports. They had an idea of producing fertilizers. Why didn't they get Norwegian public money? In, there was no. We were a young nation. We struggled to pay for, let's say, government's bills. Do, do we have any money left? No. Do we now? Yes, a million per one of us. Even incoming people from Poland, being Norwegian citizens, is counted in that number. OK? Come over. We offer you a job and a Norwegian citizenship if you, was a ni you are a nice guy. So see you next week at the labor office in Molde. Okay. What is high tech? Why is this high tech? complicated, very detailed uh, elements that are hard to copy. What is simple technology is if you, or have you already been in Bangladesh? In a cloth factory, 
in Bangladesh. You see these sewing machines they have? That is simple technology. Can be produced everywhere, not hard to, or difficult to use. This is more difficult. So there are fewer producers of cell phones than there are producing sewing machines. So simple technology is a different story. Why shouldn't public money support simple technology? It gives this country no uh, advantage. Or it's so cheap in the market, so it's not a problem to get it. How do they found sewing machines in Bangladesh? Is by micro loans, if you know of it. It depends on what chapter you choose, but we can mention micro, micro loans before the end of the course. But that is up to you to decide. Is it okay? Yeah. So micro loan simply means a very small loan on specific conditions where they can pay for this cheap technology. So yes, support high tech because it's hard to get the money. Okay. Why is it a problem to identify knowledge generation or? to create knowledge. Why is it so difficult to understand? I'll give you three reasons. It's hard to see what is inside there. But inside there is knowledge. It's hard to know if this head has knowledge inside that once in the future will produce a very expensive product. Or it's hard to know if this head means somebody else who have a different ID and you can combine this ID and come up with a new product. If this had been in the 60s, 60s, one of the guys would be Bill, and the other one was Steve. And Bill's name was, full name was, and he ended up with Microsoft. And Steve was Steve Jobs, and he ended up so no one could tell that this is the future Steve. And it's not Bill, but it is Belina, who has the other head. So it's so hard to know now what the future outcome of uh, knowledge would be. OK? Do you know the guys? This is for the Norwegian, who ended up here. Then none of you saw the Norwegian 200 minutes of Norwegian history 200 years in. His name was Sam, which is a standard Norwegian name. We call him Uncle Sam. So there are some heads. If you combine them, the value of knowledge could be very high. You need not be Bill. You can be Sam. You need not be Steve. But if you are Steve and meet Bills in the 60s in US on the West Coast, that is a tremendous combination of knowledge. Because that's what it's all about, knowledge. <coughs> so we know in the future. And that is the second reason why it should be public money. And this is traditional business administration courses that you have, because all of you have investments and financing, don't you? You didn't pass? You didn't know that you could choose it? OK. But you could have had it. OK. What is the, let's say, central or essential element of Investment theory is risk. What is the problem with risk? Is that you not, don't know the outcome of it. You can do a lot of risky business. Then it's easier for the public sector to fund it. Because if one of it is a disaster, the other one could be a success, and the combination could be paid for by the society. Because they lose the money there, they gain extra money there, and the sum is plus. Do more of it. So to handle risk, no one is better to do that than the public sector. Simply because they earn what this head can get off 
in the future. And if it's negative, the head behind is positive, and the sum of it is plus. So that is maybe the most important part for public support. And that is the conclusion of why shouldn't it not be supporting import substitution. These heads are domestic. These heads meet domestically. These products start to be a domestic production. Guess if Microsoft were exporting their products from day one. No, they weren't. Where they, did they produce them? Where did Microsoft and Apple start their production? Uh, Silicon Valley, yeah, probably Silicon Valley, at least Los Angeles area, or California. Why was it in California? Uh, I don't know, but uh, because of Bill and uh, uh, Steve were students and they were at the University of California, I don't know. Yeah, or Los Angeles, or Berkeley. So there are more universities on the West Coast than it is in the central of the US. Why are there so many universities on the East Coast of the US is not the sun, but history. On the West Coast, it's obviously the sun, because the industry moved to the sun belt, and therefore it's on the West. But they started on the East. How many of you know when California became an American state? much later than 1776, when the East Coast became United States of America. So some of this is historical based, but some is based on the weather. So that's the reason why there are so many good universities on the west coast of Norway. Not because of the weather, because of the history. I guess you have not noticed our sun belts yet. But there is one in Norway but not on the West Coast. Okay. So yes, public money is important. Put it into universities, because then the bright heads end up in the university instead of surfing. Because that is the alternative if you are young in California, isn't it? Or you make a movie. But if you ask me, should you make a movie or produce a Microsoft PC, my answer would be surf in your free time in holidays, produce Microsofts on a daily basis. So yes, public money into this, hopefully into universities. Way into a university, you can answer next time. Why produce it in large scales? Is, is uh, economy of scale, yes? Get more out of your resources earn more profit. And if you don't believe me, call not Bill Gates because he's left the company. Don't try to call Steve Jobs. If he answer, put the phone down immediately. If you get access to him, contact an American soap opera producer and you will be a multimillionaire. Because then you are the first one to really speak to Steve Jobs after he passed away, as they say over there, or as we say here, after he died. So most of you who speak to dead people try to read more international economics in your spare time. Is that a fair deal too? Okay. <coughs> Spencer and Wagner. It sounds almost like an Arsenal football player, but I think his name is Bentner. So he's not a football player. He is one of the researchers that came up with a theory and used example of a super jumbo aircraft. Do you know what a super jumbo aircraft is? We know the forerunner. We call it Concorde. Supersonic, not very big, but very fast. This is the alternative. Instead of producing a very fast aircraft, you produce a very big aircraft. So 
but that's a super yacht. I think it's called 777 now or something like that. I think the first Yumbo was 747, was it? Okay, yeah. Who produced Super Yumbos? Boeing and in? They are both in front. Should they be subsidized? Well, according to Bradner and his colleague Spencer, it could be an alternative. And then the question is, those of you who have read the chapter from page one to the last page of the chapter, is Krugman supporting their hypothesis? No. There are problems with subsidizing aircraft industry like that. It could end in what we call a trade war. It's not what Russia is trying to uh, start in Crimea. That is a different war. The trade war simply means that they subsidize and subsidize and subsidize and the gain of it is public money lost, and they come out with the same outcome as without subsidies. So why start a war when you lose the money? I won't ask the Germans, who had been through two big wars. I won't ask the French, who were very good at running wars a hundred years earlier. I think we also run into a few wars in our time. We lost area by doing it. So don't start any war if you can avoid it. And that is the conclusion of Krugman too. Yes. Okay? So if you start a trade war, it simply means you lose money. Could you afford to lose money when you have 5,000 billion? You would think yes, but if you ask me, I'm a citizen here, I would say no. We have better things to use our money on. For instance, letting incoming students study free in Norway. That is a much better way to spend our money. Don't you agree? All of you Norwegian, it is better to have incoming students in addition to Norwegian. Because if it hadn't been for the incoming students, it would be less than half of you here. I think that would be a little bit more boring than being at least double as many. Okay? So that is a better way to spend the money. Why should we spend it on students coming in? Yeah, so we gain from it. What about us? Clever students coming in. Inspiring the Norwegian ones? Yes. Clever students going back home or to another country? Well, uh, no. The French might end up in Italy, the Italian might end up in Spain, but still they bring their head back home. Probably wiser than they came. If not, come back and fish. You can lose some of your money. Okay. And then we are into the anti-globalization movement. Before we take the break, a few words about it. It is known in France as attack, isn't it? No? Anti-globalization movement. Was it attack? Wasn't it? Written like this? K, C K. Okay. What was the major slogan? Simply reduce globalization, which means less trade. If you ask me, I think the major purpose was reduce the inequalities in the society all over the world. And that means between countries as well. So the basic idea is lift Bangladesh at the expense of US, because US have enough money. They don't have enough money in Bangladesh. So do something uh, to reduce the gap 
to see the country. Okay? And then you have to think of Ricardo or David among friends. Trade is not reducing the value of the resources in any country. It can lead to a maldistribution of income, but the income is higher with trade than it is without. So, yes, they might have been right that there are two big gaps in the world economy. But the answer is, if you ask me, join in with So before the break, what is Wall Street? It's not a commercial. It's not a soap opera. It is in fact a place. It is a street. What is actually taking place in this street? You can start, where is it? The stock market in Munich. Where they buy and sell stocks. Do they produce any goods? Do they come up in innovation? Yes, they do. They come up with very weight. What is it? We call it new money instrument. What did they use it for? They packed up what we call crap. It was American house loans to people in the US that could not pay for their house loan if the money no the house market broke down. Did it break down? When did it break down? October. What happened to the world economy after two thousand and eight October was and the financial crisis. So if you ask me if you should support a cut, well, if you, in addition, support Occupy Wall Street, because that is the problem. What happened to the world economy when all these derivatives turned out to have no value? The banking system almost broke down. Do you know any place that, that they had had the same problem before? And now I look at the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Norwegian. In nineteen ninety, in December nineteen ninety, the Minister of Finance in Norway announced that the Norwegian banks could soon be going bankrupt. Did they go bankrupt? Yes, in nineteen ninety one. Who took over? Norwegian state bought all the four biggest merchant banks in Norway. Did they lose money from it? With no except, well, one exception, no. How did they earn money? They survived. They were run by the public for a few years and then sold to Denmark. I think also a Finnish bank came into the market. They paid the price of the bank, plus a little uh, profit, with one exception, which is K Bank. And none of you know about it, but it was in the region. Bank. Yes, it could be running by the public sector. But did they do that in the US? No. I think that is the problem. The way we solved the crisis could have saved the world a lot of problems. If you wonder if it is not very good for Italy, the answer is not yet. For Spain, not at all. For Greece, even worse. So yes, it could have been. What happened to Norway was simply that after a few years, the Norwegian states sold out their banks, earned money from it, and the Norwegian economy was prepared for October 2008. Because what happened in Norway was 
in 2008. Did any Norwegian bank collapse? No. Did the Norwegian economy collapse? No. Are there high unemployment in Norway? Not yet. So there are solutions to it. And that is what Occupy Wall Street is trying to come up with. Regulate financial institutions. Don't let them be innovative. Don't let them create derivatives. Because that's the worst thing they can do. Do they earn money from it? If you don't believe me, it is a song. I think the band is Irish, isn't it? Man is it English? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the very group of four, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. But this is also the title of a documentary on American banking system. So while you think if we should run through chapter 17, watch this. I think it's titled in Norwegian, so the subtitles you can exercise your Norwegian on, but I think the, uh, the text is English, so you can follow the story. That's it. Okay, so this is the question, what chapter should we choose? If you don't choose chapter 17, you can watch Money for Nothing. Not the song, takes three minutes, but the documentary. Okay? So that is what we discussed when we discussed the anti globalization movement. Probably the problem is not trade, but financial. Okay. Then you need, should we say, 10 minutes break, and then we end. 10 minutes to 5 so you can catch a bus for those who don't want to walk back to the center. Okay? 10 minutes past 4. Check this. At least 3.